attempting any trailer repair, it is recommended that you consult your owner's manual, manufacturer, or an authorized dealer before attempting any of these repairs. These repairs are made by DLMR Trailer and by our experts. What I like to do is start out with the front of the car and on the way back to the very back of your trailer. What we provided in your little pamphlet is this. This is an inspection sheet that we use at our dealership for every trailer that comes in. And I'm going to walk you through every one of these components and what you should look for. Being that it's your trailer, perspective buying the trailer, these will actually safeguard you for a great season of horse trails. So we supplied you with it so you can have it and do your own inspection if you'd like. <laughs> what I'm going to do is first is I'm going to go over and I'm going to show you the part of the truck. I hope everybody has one of these in their truck if they've got a horse trailer and that's a brake box. I hope you all have one, I hope you all know it works, and I hope you all know how it works. I install a lot of these for people, I give brief instructions on how to use it, and I tell them to read the manual. Because every one of these brake boxes work in a different fashion. The good old boxes with the surge, you know, the surge, you actually had to adjust it. A lot of the newer ones, it's already in there. You don't have to play for it. Doesn't matter what angle you play on it, the inertia switch will work. But make sure you read your instructions to your brake box. I don't care if you use digital, non-digital, whatever. If you do use digital or non-digital, you're still going to adjust your brakes by feel. And one of the key things you need to realize is when we get to the brake part of the trailer, I'll explain to you why it's key you adjust this properly. It will save you a ton of money. Okay? So we all got that down pat. What's beautiful about the new vehicles of today, especially Ford has always been the best truck on the market for tow friendliness. GM has followed suit. They're starting to catch up. Kind of went backwards, in my opinion, in the 2008 models and newer. Dodge, they've been pretty friendly except for the wiring of the brake box. Kind of haven't caught up yet. And most of your trucks, when you buy a truck and they tell you you have a tow package with the Ford product, make sure you have the brake box lead. This is a GM brake box lead, which is no longer used anymore in 2008. What General Motors have done is supplied you these wires taped up underneath your dashboard. Find them. That's number one. Once you found them, you're going to have a red wire, and that red wire is your power lead. On your brake box, the black wire is your power lead. Ford actually does color code. GM does not. What's going to really surprise you is you're going to get that red wire and you're going to put it all together and that brake box will not work. Now you got to go underneath the hood and you got to locate the wire that goes to your outside fuse box which is taped in your wiring harness somewhere. Don't call General Motors because they're going to tell you they don't know where it's at. Been there, done it. I found four different General Motors products. Three out of the floor were in different places. After you find that wire, you need to find another wire if you have a separate light circuit in your trailer, a power lead. If you do, you need to find the other wire. It's easier to find. Most of the time it's down by the brake booster. You got to untape it, pull it up, and hook it up. Ford, wire it, plug it. You're good to go. Some of the Fords you got to put relays in, but they give you great instructions. So that covers that. <coughs> Most of them will have your seven wire plug connector built right on your truck. It's all wired, ready to go. Take your seven wire plug, plug it in. Some of the older trailers use a six wire plug. Steel, round, but it's round holes. If you have a seven wire plug on your truck, don't cut your wiring on your truck. There's adapters. On the six wires, and I don't know why this is in the horse trailer industry, you have a center pin that is a hot lead, or the center pin is the brake lead. Either way, believe it or not, they make adapters for both ways. Easy way to find out if you have the right adapter, you go to a dealership or AutoZone with your trailer, 
plug it in, put it in gear. If it doesn't roll, you need the other pin. You need the other adapter. That's how easy it is to figure it out. Or you can cut it off and replace it with the seven wire pin. I recommend the seven wire over the six any day. Uh, the terminals don't tend to corrode out and you get a better connection in my opinion. And if you lubricate these with the dielectric grease, you can buy it from a parts store. Myers Electric, if you use a lot of it, you can buy big tubes, it's very inexpensive from them. Keep these things lubricated. That will prevent you from coming and having this cut off, replacing it, and also replacing your plug on your truck. All right, so that is this part of the, the function that you really need to keep track of. Because a lot of people go like this and drop it in the mud and walk away. We replace literally hundreds of these things throughout the year. We actually have it in cases. That's how many we cut off and replace. So the next thing is your cord. A lot of people plug them in. They're too long, they drag on the ground. You cut through them, we get them here, there's black tape all over it, or they're just worn out and we've got to fix them. I always take one of these. And you have it on most of your trailers. You will have, and most horse trailers have this bulldog lock assembly. Okay, you can actually, when you slam that shut, you can put that pin right in here and run your wire through that. And that will prevent it from dragging on the ground. Okay? Once we get to that part, we're going to work on electronics right now. How many people hook this cable up? How many people know what this cable does? Okay, how do you test it? Okay, pull it out. And you just got to yank hard. And believe it or not, the more you pull this out, the better off you are. Because what happens is, water gets inside this little box. It's two little pieces of spring wire. And they collapse together and make the connection. If you leave this stuck in there and never pull it out, you'll pull it out someday and it's rusted. Won't work. Right now, if I have this wired right, we're locked. The brakes are free. So all you have to do is pull this out, jump in your truck, move forward. If the wheels skid, your brake away battery in this little box, which is this, is charged and ready to go. Yes, sir? Is that charged by all systems now? No. And I was going to tell you that. You jumped the gun on me. These systems on most trailers, unless you order it, it is an option. They make a chargeable battery that is in there. There'll be a little LED light in this box. When you're plugged in, the light comes on and it says charging. You push a little button and it'll come on a green light saying it's good to go. That is a rechargeable battery. You can buy these batteries and pull them out and put a little trickle charge on them. These are a gel filled battery. They're not an acid battery. It's gel filled. It's not a liquid. You got to charge them really, really slow if you are going to charge this battery because they will melt. They don't charge down through the actual system. No, sir. Not a, none of them unless they have the charging system built into your system and you ordered it. I, there's at, at, 99% of them do not have batteries that are being charged by the truck and if they've never pulled that cable and checked it, they don't. We carry cases of these batteries. Cases. I'd say 90% of the trailers that come in, we replace this battery and we replace this breakaway switch because they were not pulled out. What does it cost to a good charging system with the little LED light and the push button. Uh, first of all, we have to see if your plug and where they route your plug. If you look here on this box, I've kind of gave you a little example of how many wires are in your trailer. And this is done very neatly. This is very rare that you find this. Okay? Most of them use these little scotch locks that look like this. And people come in to me and say, well, my lights don't work. And then when I get done finding the problem, fixing one wire the right way, 
Wow, it's that much money? Well, it takes a long time to find out when there's five or six of these scotch locks in your trailer. Plus, when they install these, and uh, we had a trailer in here, I won't say the word, but the way they had it routed, these were put in and slid up inside the tube and we couldn't get it apart because when they built it at the manufacturer, it had all these wires out, so we had to cut everything, pull it out, and find the broken wire. Okay? So you would have to make sure that one, we can get to your power auxiliary off of your truck and we can tap into it easy enough to hook up to your chargeable battery pack because it runs off your 12 volt circuit on your truck. If you can do that, the, the kit's about 70 bucks and as long as it's very easy to tap in, you're probably talking $25, $30 to put it on. It's not a big deal. If you have the 12 volt power ran in the plug and if it's easy to get to. Okay? So that's why you check your breakaway system. Okay? After you get done, and I got a tangle up here, just take this, pop it back in, and this only goes in one way. And it goes in a heck of a lot easier and it comes out. And then your wheel's free again. Okay? <laughs> Next thing we always check on these trailers is safety chains. There's usually three different types of safety chains. One manufacturer out there uses a cable. It's bound up, it's like a spring wire. I do like the idea because they don't fall on the ground and get tangled and scratch and wear through. But as time goes by, their plastic coating comes off, the cable starts getting frayed, and it starts to become an, oh, that hurts. Okay, when you're checking your safety chains, you want to make sure you haven't been dragging it on the ground, worn your links out. A lot of the trailers, the less expensive trailers, come with S-hooks. Check your S-hook, make sure it's not worn through. I've seen that on trailers, believe it or not. And make sure they've got a curve on it where you can hook it. Where they fasten, some manufacturers use nuts and bolts. Some manufacturers actually weld a little rod across there and they push the rod through the chain and weld it to the trailer. Just verify that that rod where it's welded is not rotted out. But pulling on it manually is not going to tell you anything. You need to visually look at it. On this type of chain, these will hook if this little spring lever is not there. Okay? Some people like them because they know they'll never bounce off. You can change the hook, you can't change this. This is not offered. So if you don't want this replaced, you're going to buy a whole new hook in, but you don't have to buy a chain. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Anybody here got a long chain, what do you do with it? Crisscross and they're touching the ground. Nope, you got a crisscross, and after you crisscross, that chain's still rubbing on the ground. What do you do? You twist it. Okay. Believe it or not, the chain manufacturer says it's, that it, that invalidates the strength of the chain if it ever has to be stressed. But I'm going to tell you right now that's how I do it. And if this chain ever comes off and this needs to be used, that's going to be the least worries that you're going to have about this chain snapping. So I find it very hard to believe it will snap. And that's how you as a good way to shorten up the chain is by twisting it. Always make sure you do have some sway into the chain, a loop, because when you do turn on a hard turn, they do stretch out and you don't want to, that's how you can snap your hook off. <laughs> then you go to your coupler. After you get to your coupler, and I'm going to go revert back to this, this is because of what everybody has. How many people have this where this actually snaps in real easy and works the way it does when you first bought it? Congratulations. Because you're using your best friend. Anybody who has a horse trailer, this is your best friend. Lubrication. Hinges, couplers, and a good lubrication. I was using a product that Zep made. Um, I thought it was very good. Actually, it is very good upon the test, but the only problem is the product washed away very quickly underwater. I found this product does hold up better. It doesn't tend to wash away as fast. You use WD-40, uh, you can use a blaster, but if you're going to use that product to keep this stuff working, you're going to have to keep spraying it on. The only disadvantage with this product is it does get stay a little bit greasy. What I'm going to tell you on here is when you lubricate this, this pivot right here 
is the most crucial thing that you need to keep lubricated. We heat these with torches to free them up for customers. There's also a spring in here. Okay? They do not offer that spring aftermarket. Can't buy it, but we can make it. Okay? So these do tend to go away. I'll give you another tip. If you have a tractor at home and you tend to move your trailer, do never move this with this open like this. And I can testify because I was told not to do it and I've done it all the time. Well, at Congress, I bought one of these, tore it right out. So they do pull out. I can contest to that. So it, once you've got that functioning good and it slaps back, lubricate your slide collar. Those tend to rust up too. We have problems with those. So lubricate them. Also, when you have your jack in here, double check your bolts. Make sure they're tight, haven't come loose. What we find a lot of times the threads pull out, you can nut and bolt them in there. A little bit tough, but you can do it. And that's pretty much your coupler. Now, it's very rare that you will see this style coupler with the lift tongue. It's not uncommon on the horse trailers. This is your most common coupler. If you do have a gooseneck, I did not bring a gooseneck coupler up here. If you have a gooseneck, you have that slide plate. There again, lubricate that slide plate. Lubricate your lock arm because those are basically the same points. If you don't lubricate it, you'll be heating them up with the torch and spending a lot of time to free them up. Ball grease, how many guys use ball grease? Use it. I don't care if it's ball grease, lithium grease, I don't care what it is, use it. We replace these couplers for wearing out. And they do not wear out this part, they wear holes through here. Or they'll wear your ball out. <laughs> and you'll be going, I hear clunking, banging, and I'll be saying, uh, you don't see any grease in there. They will wear out. We've replaced them. So ball grease, use it. Okay? Now we get to the jacks. This is pretty much standard on a lot of the trailers nowadays. You can lubricate these. See this little hole right here in the jack? You can spray in there. If you don't have the hole, drill a hole in it. And you can lubricate your lubricant right down there. Spray your, your best friend right here. And just keep spraying it. What you are spraying is that threaded rod. All it is is connected to the top of this threaded rod. You have a nut in this housing. And that's what you're lubricating. So when you do lubricate it, you want your jack leg all the way down. Lubricate it, you'll get the, the run down and jack it back and forth. That's all there is to it. If you have a gooseneck, some manufacturers supply a grease circ right here on the side of the gooseneck. It's a great feature, but it doesn't get to these gears. So what you do, two screws, pop the lid off, pack it full of grease, put your lid back on. The spring release, lubricate this here. That's why they have that little hand, little hand on there. And the reason they have that little hand is because nobody lubricates this and they're having a hard time to get both hands down there. When that baby lets loose, bam, you're oh boy. So that's a lubrication point. After you got done through that part of the trailer, we know that the plug's good. We know the breakaway switch is good. We know the breakaway battery's good. The next function on our list is checking all of your door latches. There again, your best friend. I can tell you, when you get your tack room door, your escape door, and you push it, and it seems real tight, and it doesn't want to latch, you got to use your handle and push it closed. If you take your lube and lube your latch pin in your door and lubricate it, you'd be surprised on how easy your door closes. So lubricate it. Lubricate your hinges. Some of these manufacturers, Texas is one, I can name other manufacturers out there, use an aluminum hinge with a steel rod through it. In our conditions, it's not a good idea. Lubricate it. 
Uh, manufacturers are right now getting rid of their aluminum hinges. They're welded onto the trailer. Yes, ma'am. That gentleman right there is the Schaefer salesman, and he's he's got some right here for you if you'd like to some. But I get it from Schaefer, and I just I got to be honest with you. This was two weeks ago that I tested this product and I started using it. It blew my ZEP 2000 away. So we, if you've got a trailer here recently, this product's on your trailer now. Um, so lubricate those hinges because those aluminum hinges, you're not going to heat them up. You're not going to break them free with the torch. Um, the only thing is you got to air hammer those pins out. You got to hone them. You got to replace them with pins, and it's a booger of a job. So this, this stuff is your best friend. I'm telling you, live or die. Keep it in your trailer. Sitting around, waiting for somebody to come back or whatever, pull this out and just go to town. Yes, it does make your white siding a little bit icky, but if you wipe it off, it doesn't do too bad. Okay, after you lubricate all your hinges and that, what's next on my list here? We checked our trailer plug, trailer lights. How many people check their trailer lights for turn signals and turn the light turn signal on, walk back and check? Turn the left one, walk. Don't do that no more. It's good exercise, but you don't need to do that. Reach inside your truck, hit your hazard switch, walk back. If both of those lights are flashing, your turn signals are going to work and your brake lights. That's all you got to do. Unless you want exercise, like me, I kind of walk back and forth sometimes, depending on my wife. <laughs> After you do that, turn on your running lights and check all your running lights. Light failure on trailers. I don't care if it's a horse trailer, uh, any type of trailer. 90% of the time, it's a faulty ground. It's very rare that you will be buying a bulb. Your best friend with the horse trailer is your test light. If you've got power, but you cannot get that test light to light off of that ground circuit on your little receptacle on your trailer, you got a bad ground. And that's most of our repairs. We sell very little light bulbs here. Got a bunch of them, but we sell very little of them. And unfortunately, there are tons of different light bulbs for these trailers. And I, I give you an example. We just ran into a product. It was an LED light. We, are, we buy direct from three manufacturers. Not one of the manufacturers knew the light. Turned out that trailer manufacturer had that light specifically made by a company out of China. And the only place you're going to get that light is from that manufacturer. The light cost me $6.95 and $8 in shipping for one light. So... Double check your grounds before you purchase a light. Most of the time, that's what you'll find. If you do not have power, scotch locks. I'd say right now, probably 23% of the horse trailer manufacturers out there are still using this. Around here, this is the kiss of death, especially if you are a winter time user. This will kill you. So after you find out it's not a bomb, it's hunting fine. It takes a while to do. Okay, we've checked all of our lights. All of our lights are working good. Now we're going to go to electric brakes. I've already explained to you on your breakaway switch, your brake box. How many people know how electric brakes work? Got two, three, four. Magnets. That's it. It's magnets. You got a positive and you have a negative wire. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. The wires that come out of the back of the brake box for this magnet out of the back of your back, backing plate is the same color wire. There's not a positive. There's not a negative. So you can hook them up either way. It won't, what will still work the same function. You're just, what you're going to do is you're going to polar, polarize this magnet. It's going to get polarity. And I give you an example. Who wants to be my test person? How about you? You're going to be on camera, so you got to smile. Okay. Okay. What I want you to do is just stand over here and take this, and I want you to hold this right like that, okay. about that far away. Okay. 
Well, don't believe them, okay? Oops, I better plug it in. Okay, are you ready? Now try to pull it off. Okay, try to spin that wheel. Try to spin that wheel, that rubber wheel. Your brakes are off. I'll get that. But that's how it works. And what you have is on your brake drum, you have a smooth face right here. And that magnet grabs that smooth face. And what it does is when you're in a forward motion, this pulls forward, pushes this shoe back, and in turn locks this shoe in and grips the drum. It doesn't work as well going backwards, but they still grab. So if you have a trailer brake and you do your test, and you go forward and you have three brakes working, it's a good possibility it's a bad magnet, or, okay? So if you have that problem, it's very simple to take apart. You have a little cap here on the front of your tire, and you pop this little cap off. There's a little lock that snaps off. Good days, we used to use Carter pins. There's three different ways they hold these, these lock nuts on these wheels nowadays. Carter pin, which is very rare anymore. They have what they call cage lock, which is most common right now. And then they have what they call a flat washer lock. And what that is, is there's a flat spot on your spindle, two little fingers are sticking out, and when you tighten the nut, you bend the finger over in the castle nut and that locks it in place. You pull that apart, you can take this magnet off by undoing a clip, cut the wires, and put it in. I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest failures we see on brakes is not the magnet. The biggest failure we see is the pad coming off of the steel plate. The reason why is it's not like an automotive brake. It is not riveted. It is bonded. And how many people use their brakes to stop the truck? Boom! Every time they stop. That will tear this right off. This is our biggest failure on brakes, is losing the lining. Our second failure on brakes is the magnet wearing out. Because this magnet constantly runs on the face of that drum. Never pulls away. It's spring-loaded. And it's always running on that face. It does wear out as time goes by. That's a magnet failure. The other failure we have with brakes is this. I'm going to bring this out every time I talk wiring. And the reason why is I hate it. It's the worst thing they've ever came out with. I've been in the automotive industry, born and raised. I own my own auto service for now of 23 years. In the automotive industry, you don't see this. Okay? When it comes to wiring your truck, if you have a gooseneck, and someone wants to put a plug in the back of the bed of your truck. Some manufacturers, GM especially, does offer what they call a camper package and supplies the wires. Other manufacturers don't. What you want to do is right at the back of your seven wire plug in the bump of your truck, you put this in. It's a T-connector. Unplug, plug in, everything's barrel tight. This runs into the bed of your truck, it plugs in. None of these. And that dielectric grease I told you about, that's your best friend, fill these plugs in. And that's the way you eliminate wiring problems, yes. The box for the plugs, I have to replace them every spring. I don't go anywhere in the winter. Dielectric grease. And the problem is, is with your plug, you do pack it. Right. Well, what I ask you is when you put the seven wire plug on, on your truck, that's what you're talking about. When you put the plug on, do you do it? Does your husband pack the backside full 
of dielectric grease before he puts the wires back into the box, the plug. Because if you don't, it's going to ride out from the back. And then what you do is when, if you ever get one of our plugs that we install on your truck and think you're going to cut it apart, you will say, Jesus, these guys love silicone. Because what we do is when we have that plug, and what she's talking about is when you replace your truck plug, on the newer trucks, they have this plug. And it's simple. You undo the four screws, the plug comes off, you unsnap this, and snap in a new one. You don't have to cut the wires and run them into this plug. If you look at the back of these plugs, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the back of these plugs, they're wide open. They give you this little rubber thing and you clamp it down. Well, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. What you have to do is pack that full of grease, put it together, take a caulk and gun of silicone with that white piece, we throw it out. We take silicone and we actually pump it until it starts oozing out in between the wires and everything. Then you, the screws that hold in the plug into the, the receptacle, silicone notes. Then black tape it. Then silicone it and black tape it. That's why you're rotting out. It's coming from the backside. And you got to prevent that. And then pack your plug. And it should last. That's what he needs to do to solve that problem. And I guarantee it'll work. All right. What, what she's talking about, some of these vehicles out on the market have a stoplight in the back and have an amber turn signal light. And the module she's talking about is trailers only have one bulb that does both functions. So if you buy a vehicle and it's not pre-wired by the manufacturer and you have that light system, you have to put a logic module in. The logic modules are designed for your basic utility trailers. Not all your marker lights that you have on horse trailers. You must buy a heavy duty module. That's why they burn out too. And when you put those in, that takes your right turn and your, your uh, stop light from the right side to that box and it reduces it down to one filament bulb. They're around $36 for the standard one. A heavy duty one's about $75. And you have to free wire those in using, not these, shrink tube. Okay, and I'm, most of these guys know it. What a shrink tube is a piece of plastic slides over the wire, you heat it with the torch, it shrinks down and actually bonds to the original housing. That's the way you fix these trailers. Anytime you got electrical, shrink tube fit them. And you won't have your problem again. So that's a good thing and that's what you need to do and that should solve your problem. So once we've got the brakes checked, we've checked the bearings, you pop out your bearings, you wash them, spin them in your hand. A lot of people, when they check a bearing, they take it and spin it so it's off, feels fine. The way you check a bearing, <coughs> excuse me, on a trailer, is you take your two fingers, put the bearing, the tapered edge, away from your hand, onto your fingers, and grab two fingers on the outer cage and push it when it's clean and there's no grease, and if it doesn't click, click, click and feel bindy, it's usually a good bearing. Look at the bearing itself, see if there's any pits. If there's pits, pitch it, get yourself a new bearing and a race. The race actually is a hardened steel piece that pounds inside this drum. Another thing that a lot of trailers have, it's good, but it's bad. On this trailer here, if you look, this little cap comes off of your axle. Inside there is a little grease circ. That is so you can pump grease into your bearings to keep them lubricated, which is good. But if you read Dexter's manual that you should get when you bought your trailer, one shot. No more than that. You're done. The reason why is grease turns into oil. When you're driving down the road, it heats up and it turns into a liquid. If you overfill and this is a good example because this one's way over full. If you overfill this hole and it liquefies, it has to go somewhere. What it tends to do is right here, if you look, you'll see the seal has all grease on it. Let's well, start shooting out the back of this drum. What happens then, it coats these brakes with grease. 
And guess what? Those brakes work really good. They work too good. You can't adjust them down. Because once these brake shoes are coated with grease, I don't care how you clean them, it's impermeated into it, you are never going to save those shoes again. And you will have a grabby brake every time. So do not overfill these. We got the brakes checked. Next thing, we checked the wheel bearings. Tires. Tell you what, big issue with tires. I called Goodyear last week. Talked to a gentleman at Goodyear about ST tires versus light truck tires. I was actually very surprised they didn't know much about them. And this is Goodyear. The Goodyear Marathon ST, which is the trailer tire out there. In talking with the gentleman, he had basically stated light truck tires are good. They're actually better than a trailer tire. In the conversations with them, being I'm in the automotive industry, uh, a lot of you guys have changed your tires. You get in there, you got a big gap all the way around that tire. You could wrap your arms around there and hug that tire when it's on your truck. Try to do that on a horse trailer. You're not going to do it. We got into talking about heat factor. How the tires heat up. How do they dissipate the heat? There's not a lot of air moving around these trailers, especially if you have an 8Y. He said, you know, you're right. Good possibility if you have a light truck tire, being it's a thicker and heavier tire, it's going to retain the heat. It's probably going to blow. Said, so what do we do now? He got into talking. Turned out that NASCAR and their big race semi trailers, they're having a big time heating problem and blowing tires. Goodyear custom built them tires in a commercial line for their NASCAR truck trailers because they were heating up and blowing out and they found out it was heat. His recommendation was manufacturer's recommendation on tires. That was his answer. Um, I'm a firm believer in the ST tire. It's a tracking tire and he agreed with that. I asked him, is it a tracking tire? He said, oh yeah, it's definitely a tracking tire. So I said, shouldn't it pull better? Well, we got into the belts. And he very again said that the truck tire should pull just as good. If you really want to get a good tire, jump into your commercial line tire. But they don't make it in the sizes of standard horse trailer tires. So pretty much put on and see how they wear is basically what it all boiled down to. I was lucky enough that we just got in the mail today, and I can make copies for you. A little diagram on Goodyear tires. And in here it's telling you what to do with your tires. Pretty much what we discussed on the phone. Stick with what the manufacturer put on and what your tire sticker recommends. If you're having problems, either try a light truck tire or if you have a light truck tire, try to move to an ST tire. ST tires are inherently less expensive. It's my opinion that once we sell, we are not having problems with them. And a lot of it has to do with inflation. Underinflated tires will heat up faster and blow. Overinflated tires will wear out faster because you're running on the center part of the tire. So it's kind of like you guys need to be a little bit of a judge. If you got a real heavy load on, two horses, got a full tack, going away for the weekend, got my cooler full of pop beer or whatever, I might want to put them up to the maximum PSI. I've got one horse in there, I've got it downloaded, maybe drop it down five, six pounds. Believe it or not, two pounds of, temperature, of pressure will change the temperature of a tire and also the grow rate of that tire. If you ever watch NASCAR, you'll hear them say we made an adjustment and put one pound in a tire and it will change dramatically because of the temperature and how the tire gains air. <coughs> Tires, dry rot. It's so another thing you need to check. They tend to sit out there and they tend to crack. If you've got a dry rotted tire, it's no good. Replace it. Check your spare. I'd be surprised at how many people have tires that have covers on them. And usually the cover does prevent them from dry rotting. But believe it or not, a lot of covers don't cover the backside of the tire. And the backside of the tire is dry rotted. I've seen it here. Sure can. Because once we had a problem with the, with the tires, we actually got new tires. Now we were all over the road, and 
I have, I've actually had people too that'll come in and they'll buy an SUV and on SUVs when your truck look at what you buy if you have a P rated tire and you're feeling like this in your vehicle get rid of the P rated tires you need a light truck tire that's one of the fallacies you will find on half ton pickup trucks majority of them will come with P rated tires that's a passenger tire and when you get a trailer on the back of there those sidewalls tend to flex and that will make you feel like you're all over the road so when you purchase tires for your truck and you're pulling trailers make sure you put a light truck tire on that truck not just on the back either because those tires will grow as revolutions go less than what a passenger tire will grow and you will notice the difference on how that vehicle handles that way too so if you are towing a vehicle you should have light truck tires on period not passenger and that could be what you're feeling too Did you? Yeah, I do now. Could have been what you bought too. There are, you know, Goodyear tires are made in China. All the marathons come from there because I asked them that question. We sell a tire called Road King. It's a Chinese made tire made by Cooper. And he had nothing bad to say about that tire. And it's about $30 less than a Goodyear. This was a while ago, but it was a Cooper tire. Yeah. And it was a tow behind But was it a passenger tire or a light truck tire too? could be a difference so that's watch your tire pressures watch your dry rot and that should really resolve your problems with the tires as far as the next thing is framing I've got on there check frames don't have to be a body hammer just a hammer go around and check your frame under your trailer last year I believe Heather's not in here. Last year, we condemned six trailers from rotted out frames. Six. Two of them in the tongue, and the rest of them were right over where the axles meet the frame, especially if you have a tube frame, because the inside of that tube is not protected at all. Period. If you have an aluminum trailer, you need to check your subframe. On an aluminum trailer, those axles are not mounted into aluminum. It has a subframe, the axles are welded or bolted to the subframe, then that subframe has a poly material in between the aluminum and the steel, and it's bolted or huck fastened. I'm a firm believer in any aluminum trailer, you don't want to find a nut and bolt in it. Huck fastened because nuts and bolts come loose. Huck fastens do not come loose, and that's what's used on semi-trailers. So if you're gonna buy a trailer, that's one of the key things in aluminum that you wanna look for. Uh, on, the, on the goosenecks, majority of them are huck fastened together. The whole bottom part of that gooseneck frame is gonna be steel up front with that poly in between the aluminum and steel. The bumper pulls, they all will have a bolted on coupler because you can't weld those on so those are basically the only bolts you're going to be checking is where your your axles bolt on and where your coupler bolts on on an all aluminum trailer but there's a fancy word out there and it is called oxidization it's the same thing as rust the aluminum trailers do oxidize if you own an aluminum trailer you better double check your warranty if you haven't been acid washing your trailer just about every manufacturer out there has it in their warranty that you need to acid bat that trailer at least once a year and there are manufacturers out there that will tell you twice a year and when you do acid wash it if you do it yourself I recommend you don't tell anybody because it's illegal as hell to do in the state of Ohio and secondly save your receipts from your acid wash if you do not have your receipts from your acid wash and you have a failure on your frame from oxidization they're not going to warrant it steel frames this is from one horse trailer that's one horse trailer that trailer was condemned the manufacturer did replace that frame this manufacturer we have had 16 frame failures 
Seven of the 16 were warrantied by the manufacturer. The rest of them, they were out of luck. And we're not talking inexpensive trailers, we're talking trailers that were in the excess of fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars. Yes. That trailer two thousand. And this was found four years ago. I've got a trailer out in the back. Anybody's more than welcome to stop by here anytime they want. We still have it. It's made by a manufacturer that has a good name. I was a dealer for him. I blame the storage on this trailer. Um, anybody who stores the trailer, if you don't store it on pavement, if you're storing it on gravel, uh, I highly recommend you put plastic down there, prevent that vapor from coming up. Uh, keep the grass down low around that trailer because once that grass grows up everybody in here has moved something that's been sitting on the grass forever big mud hole that stuff just sits there and just eats your trailer away so if you're keeping your trailer at your home you can do it if you're keeping it at a stable hey double check where you're parking it because it will become an issue and you will end up like that trust me as a man as a, a, a repair facility we don't want to tell people we, we feel sick when you got to call somebody and say we got a problem I can't fix your trailer the gentleman with the trailer that I have back there at the time I was a, a, a dealer for that manufacturer it's a good product and the gentleman I explained to him how did you store the trailer it wasn't his fault it was the products fault but I've only seen two in the nine years I've been here of that product failing so I have to believe it's more of the way he stored the trailer. So it's real critical on how you store your trailer. Is it stored over dirt? It was stored in a field. And when the trailer was brought here by a tow truck because the brakes were locked, it was a mud hole. It was dragged onto the truck. And when we got here, we condemned it, and I've had the trailer, and we finally got the certificate of origin just this fall. And it, we're going to scrap it this spring. How long? He had it sitting in his yard for two years. <laughs> exactly. So, um, are there any questions? Oh, one more thing. I forgot one more thing, and I apologize. The floor. There you go. You don't need a pointed hammer. Everybody pretty much knows what good wood sounds like. But if you get a floor and you hit it, and this hammer goes in and sticks in, you got a rotted floor. If a chunk comes off, you've got a rotted floor. Yes? On the trailer brakes, it used to be, maybe I'm wrong, but the override switch on the box used to go past what your settings were. Not anymore. Does anybody, in other words, you set your trailer brakes so they don't bind the knockoff, correct? You do. Okay, so you're cruising down the road, somebody pulls in front of you, and you want a little more. In other words, I don't care if my horse's head hits the front of that trailer, I would like a little more brake action than I had dialed in. I can no longer get that with the override, correct? Correct, it does not go to full load. So in other words, why do they have to? I mean, there's absolutely no reason. Ice. And I'm going to tell you, well, no, seriously. I mean, if... if Ten years ago, you hit it, and you could go full load. Full bore. Hmm? So now you put your brakes so it's comfortable for your horses not to slam their face against the trailer. But if someone pulls in front of you and you want to slam their face against the trailer and save your life, you got it. The inertia switch built into the unit will, I'm, I'm just telling you, I don't build them, but the inertia switch that's built in the unit, when you're in that panic mode, it will gain the brakes. Not as much. Not as much. No. If it was full load, no. I mean, you're talking, I want to slam down there and just hold it over, and I'm expecting the lock solid. No. And nobody does that. I'm not going to say nobody. The manufacturers that I carry and I've seen, there's a box out there. I won't produce the name because I don't sell them and I don't promote them. Uh, it begins with a P. I mean, when they first came out, it was the best thing sliced since sliced bread. I personally think it was a way to get everybody's money. Uh, I put the box in one of my trucks. I tried it. I wasn't, it didn't wow me. It didn't make differences in the way I drove the vehicle. Um, the, 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 this switch here is really designed on icy road conditions. Uh, my wife can contest to it. She's flipped her trailer on uh, 
4422, 0422 by Riverside Bar. Lost it on that bridge on an ice storm. And she wasn't fast enough to reach down here to no, I gotta accelerate my truck, pull that on, and pull my trailer straight. And that's the whole point of that. And that's why they have eliminated surge brakes. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's trailers out there that have surge brakes on them. If you live in Ohio or any place that it snows and you use it in the wintertime, don't buy that trailer. Because the only way that trailer stops, it pushes your vehicle. So if you're on ice and you're trying to slow down, you don't have the luxury of reaching in here, that trailer is going to hit you and then those brakes are going to turn on. But if it's icy, it's going to hit you, push you forward, brakes aren't going to work. It's going to hit you and you're going to lose control. They're outlawed in several states. But this manufacturer, being it's a European trailer, gets away with importing them in here. Mm -hmm. Prodigy. It's a prodigy. Okay. Yeah. And that prodigy doesn't know what your weight is in your trailer, doesn't know how many horses you have. That prodigy is, like I said, the inertia switch. It's working on circuitry on the surge of your truck. And you fail one circuit in that. You don't know until you go to use that. I'm, me personally, I'm not a digital control fan. I do it by feel. I tell a lot of people the digital box is nice because it gives you in the range of what you know. I carry one horse. This is what I normally have. I know I start out with adjusting it at four and a half. But now I put a friend's horse in that you may go with several times. Now I want to put it up to six. But it gets you in a range. You still have to fine tune these in. And you got to realize this brake drum hasn't been used for four months. You haven't took this out. This is full of rust right now. Full of rust. So when you first hit those brakes, boom, they're really going to lock up on you. You got to wear them in a little bit. Now all of a sudden it's different. Now I've got to readjust it to satisfy my usage. So, you know, when you first start out this year, you're going to probably have to play with the brakes a little bit before you get them and you work into what they want. And that's like if we have a real damp summer, a lot of rain, you're going to notice your brakes are acting really weird because they rust very quickly. I use my trailer like 12 months out of the year for the other season to go out, you know. You're, you're the need, you need to get, get him underneath there and start banging away. I mean, when you go to buy a used trailer, it's funny, I've gone to look at trailers for people and I pull this out. Not a ball peen hammer, and the people just go like this. What are you gonna do? First thing I do is get on my back and I'm right at those axles. That seems where they want to ride out the most, or at the very back of the trailer, because people do not lift their mats and don't hose out the urine. And that urine is acid. So I go to the back. These people are like, what are you doing? And then when it goes, uh, that this trailer's no good. So pull that hammer out. Don't be shy. You're spending money. Undercoating. That's that's what it does. I mean, the the manufacturers now are using Rhino Liner. That's one of the biggest. There's another name, Tough Coat. Uh, I've got a trailer manufacturer out there right now that I'm selling a steel line. It's powder coated painted. It's durable. Yes, I give you that. But when they take this piece of steel and this piece of steel and they weld it, there's nothing in between these two pieces of steel. There's nothing there. And when I build your trailer and I rhino liner it, then get in between there, it's going to rust. I mean, I've, I, when, when, I, when I start, I've been doing horse trailer repair because when I married my wife, I was not a horse person. To this day, I'm not a horse person. I am a maintenance man. That's what I do on my farm. Okay? And when I married my wife, I all of a sudden became a real good trailer repair man because she introduced me to some friends and the next thing I knew, this friend wanted something and I started fixing horse trailers every weekend. That's where I got into doing this and really saw a lot of weird stuff. 
that I'm like an automotive technician going, whoa, this is crazy, I wouldn't do it this way. But as I've been doing this throughout the years, I initially said, no, aluminum trailers are no good. I would not buy an aluminum trailer. Aluminum cracks. Aluminum doesn't bend. Well, as I've been doing this more and more for the past 10 years, I have started to become a fan of aluminum trailers. I'm not saying I'm a full fan yet, but, and you're never going to get an answer out of any of these manufacturers when you're looking at a trailer. A lot of people do not realize there's several different grades of aluminum. You're not going to see a horse trailer built out of aircraft aluminum. It's not going to happen. If you did, you wouldn't be sitting here because you'd have somebody else maintain it, haul your horses, you'd watch somebody ride them because that trailer would cost you a fortune. Some of these manufacturers are using byproduct aluminum that is not good aluminum. Those are the ones that we're seeing cracked. Uh, my niece Heather was here and we had a gentleman deliver a trailer and this guy had a whole ton of a trailer in the bed of his truck. And I looked at it and I go, whoa, where'd that come from? He goes, wow, we're going through New York City. Remember that guy with that tongue in the back of his truck? Going to New York City. Snapped right off. Brand new trailer. He was delivering it. Snapped right off. And I'm sad to say I was a dealer for that manufacturer nine years ago. Glad I'm not now. So you've got to watch what you're buying. I tell you to stick with your bigger manufacturers, uh, Elite, Four Star, Hart, um, Exus, Sooner, um, Miley. Um, those older manufacturers that have been around a long time because they, one, have the insurance if you're going to sue them. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I've, I've, be, being in this business, we have heard, we've done Congress two years in a row. Uh, we have done a lot of shows last year. Uh, we've got a lot of shows this year. We hear tons of horror stories. And we do hear them about our products that we sell too. And the key thing is, is how that manufacturer is going to rectify your problem. And so talk to your friends. If they had a bad experience, how did it get fixed? Even if they did, the key thing is how did it get repaired? Is anybody else? Yes? How, how straight does a trailer have to sit in the bottom? I just got to Bumper pull or gooseneck? Gooseneck. I mean, it's kind of, my truck is a lot higher than my other truck. Got a Ford? Yeah. Ford, that's one of the, one of the key things that's wrong with Ford. Uh, the only way you can really level off your trailer, you can only drop your tongue so far in the tube. And you can actually, some of the manufacturers, whose trailer do you have? Okay. If you pull your tube out, there's a collar sometimes up inside that tube on your gooseneck. And you remove that to drop your ball down a little more. Do not exceed more than seven inches from the top of your bed to the bottom of your gooseneck. Or, or you put different axles in to raise the back end up. Then he needs longer legs to climb in and out. But that's a problem with Ford products. Ford has the best, best truck suspension in the market and as an automotive technician if you're going to buy a truck and you want a truck that can haul the weight with no problems forget mileage forget sound forget comfort you buy a Ford if you want a truck in my opinion this is my opinion I don't care if you're a Dodge man or a Ford or whatever I have a GMC one of the gentlemen Tom back there has a Ford we've towed with both of them and we've towed with Dodges I had Dodges Chevy gives you greater fuel economy, gives you a better ride, it's quieter, but it does tend to sag when you put a big trailer on it. Back to the plug. Yes. Can you use, instead of the grease, can you use the spray, the electric contact spray? Yes, you can. The, you got to be careful and make sure that you have no graphite in that type of spray because it will, it will carry continuity. How I got started is originally I was blowing fuses in the truck. It's a Ford, and I went to the drive, and they said, well, it's a common problem in Fords. You should go get more stuff in there and just keep can and spray every time you connect. So far, several years later, I've not had a problem. Right. But I was blowing 
Some of the manufacturers of a penetrate and lubricant material, and the gentleman back there from Schaefer could probably answer you more because that's his, his forte. Um, they do put graphite in them. And if you got graphite, it will, it's, you know, graphite's like a lead pencil, and it will carry continuity, and it can make your lights go a little bit crazy. And you're going to be going, whoa, what's going on? And that's why. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Me personally, I think what you need to ash wash is your undercarriage and your inner floor of your horse area. I mean, if you try to ash or wash the top half of that trailer and you don't go someplace to know what they're doing, you're going to be really upset when you see your white walls looking really bad. Uh, we take our trailers to Pete's Truck Stop in Geneva. That's where we have it done. He's done several of our trailers, and I have no complaints, and he's very fair in price. That's where we go. I do not acid wash here. That's one of the reasons I have that porta potty, by the way. There's a porta potty through that door, and I have too many people here to use my facility for restrooms. Um, we do not do anything against the EPA regulations because we had to fight the EPA to get this building here. So we have several visits from the EPA. So we will not acid wash. It's illegal to acid wash unless you're recycling the fluid that you're using. So if you happen to have a neighbor and he, you know, might not be too happy if his lawn dies up. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, he's on the 90 at the Geneva exit. Is it Dales? Yeah, Dales. I'm sorry, Dales. Yes. I'm Dale and I forget that name. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I want to say thank you, and I hope this was very informational to you. If you have any questions or want me to show you anything after this, it's fine. Um, I did, uh, luckily, the gentleman there from Schaefer Oil Products, when he found out I was doing this, he asked if he could come. Um, we have tried some of his products in our diesel trucks, and with fuel economy, as important as it is right now, I said, sure, more than welcome to come. He's actually got some gifts back there for you, and he'd love to show you what he's got offered. Um, anybody goes back there, he'll give you some type of one of his products. We have something up here that he was more than gracious to say. Anybody stop by, they can pick any of that product and he'll give it to you. Uh, he's also donated uh, some gloves up here for you. And what we'd like you to do is when you do stand up, look underneath your chair. If you don't have a tag, we have some empty chairs here, and you might find a tag under a chair next to you, and you come up and pick up your number. There is uh, one thing that we have our giving away. He didn't bring his, did he bring him in? Okay, we have a gentleman who's Nathan's detail. He does not acid wash, but he does a great job cleaning out trailers, pressure washing them, getting rid of all the manure and stuff. And he's graciously given three cleanings for horse trailers too. So when you get up, look underneath your chairs. If you got a tag, if you don't have one, look at chairs next to you. And Barb, you don't apply. I don't.